Um, so the, as you know that this is a part of uh, UK IV uh, project, uh, UK India Educational Research in, uh, the Initiative, um, and uh, which is being run between IIT Gandhinagar as me uh, as a PI and uh, in the Newcastle University as a David Werner as a PI. Um, and this is our second year and uh, final concluding uh, seminar. Um, so the, we have selected uh, over the two years of deliberation, we have seen that this is five C's of water vulnerability. Actually, water vulnerability is term that has been used in this uh, project uh, title. And uh, so these five we have been uh, uh, the discussing for last three days uh, from December 14 to December 16. Um, and uh, every day it, it has been started, uh, it was started at uh, 4.30. Uh, so far we have the speaker from five plus countries. We are discussing 10 themes. So which means uh, that this is an uh, almost eighth uh, theme that we are discussing uh, today. Uh, 200 plus participants has registered so far officially. Um, and I will get an update uh, if uh, uh, it, this number was for a uh, day before, that 360. Uh, just now uh, I am told that 360 uh, participants has registered. And uh, the 30 plus guest speakers has been invited and agreed to come over. Just to give the, uh, this is the agenda. So we are now December uh, the 16, and here is the three speaker, eminent speaker that will be talking on this uh, um, theme on vulnerability to resilience and role of rapid testing. Um, so with, uh, and so far the earlier, uh, you can see that uh, the, we had a guest speaker in the inaugural session uh, from a director of uh, uh, the NIRI. And uh, then of course, uh, the followed by we had, uh, there was COVID session also, where Arun Bivin is from the USA, uh, Dr. Honda, Masake Kitajima, they have attended. Then we did uh, on environmental engineering solutions, then uh, uh, the groundwater uh, thing. Uh, of course, Daniel uh, can, uh, would have a fit in any, anything, uh, but of course uh, we know that uh, the rapid testing is his uh, forte. Nobody can beat him in their field. So I gave that one. Then we had uh, the next day, uh, the we, on 15th yesterday, we talked about contaminant transport and remediation. I am going to read these, uh, whatever the sentences are there in today's concluding session. So just I brought that uh, the speakers and Kishore has already uh, talked yesterday about microbiological water quality. And today he is going to talk about NGS uh, technique. Uh, Sanjeev is also here uh, and who gave uh, um, on the microbial uh, ARB, he talked about uh, yesterday and public health and conflicts we had the participant from Gujarat Pollution Control Board, Central Pollution Control Board, UNICEF, and our own. Uh, this one. Last session, we already talked about climate change and it was a very amazing session. Uh, so now next, uh, today, now we are going to talk this. This will be the order because uh, I want to, uh, the, no, 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 uh, just uh, you can. So this is the theory, uh, the, the Dr. Kisor will uh, talk first then uh, Professor Esno and then uh, Gianta. Uh, so now uh, I would formally start the, this uh, session uh, called Vulnerability to Resilience and Role of Rapid Testing. Uh, the mode will be that uh, because we have the only uh, the three speakers in this, uh, we will, you can take 10 minutes uh, without any doubt. And if you have something uh, great to say, of course you can. Uh, exceed for another two minutes. And then we will have a discussion. I, ha I have already prepared some questions uh, to be asked from you uh, and uh, to know and learn on that. And then uh, the, if there will be interesting question from the audience, we will uh, hear that one also. So the first speaker for today, uh, I would uh, invite uh, Dr. Acharya. Kishore, tell me which visa you are using for UK. <laughs> it's a, it's a uh, global talent visa. Yeah, actually, this uh, the visa has attracted my uh, attention. He is he has uh, the global talent uh, visa, and I can tell you that uh, he originates from Nepal, but uh, the Nepal and uh, did PhD from UK, 
and he has really a very passionate researcher. He has uh, got several funds and he is very good at rapid response. And that's why he also uh, developed a novel portable method to identify pathogens in water in near real time. He is always moving to the many African countries with his mobile uh, the lab. So maybe today he is going to talk about uh, this uh, rapid testing method. Um, my teacher, Professor Ramanathan, is now uh, the online, so he will be also uh, the, listening to you. Uh, so this is uh, Dr. Kisor. Now, floor is yours. Thank you, uh, everyone, for for attending this session, and uh, thank you, Dr. Manish, for providing me to present uh, the work uh, that ha I have been actively doing for last uh, three years. Uh, so uh, uh, it's about the, uh, the portable laboratory uh, for metagenomic sequencing. Uh, we, we managed to develop in, in over the, uh, the last two years. So we call it uh, lab in suitcase and we normally use it for comprehensive water quality monitoring. So we say that, so our theme is like out of the lab into the field. So next slide, next slide please. Okay, uh, so water quality solving uh, will hold key for achieving sustainable development goals because uh, water quality monitoring is essential for achieving several United Sustainable Development Goals, including uh, uh, SDG 6, which is clean water and sanitation, uh, SDG uh, 2, zero hunger, and SDG 3, good health. For example, uh, comprehensive water quality monitoring enables uh, evidence-based management and protection of water resources, design and monitoring of water treatment and, and different kinds of sanitation system, will enable uh, safe water use in agriculture, and will also help in uh, enforcement of regulations uh, that are meant to protect consumers and the environment. So, uh, so therefore, robust and frequent water quality monitoring underpins safe water and food provision and, and, and of course good health. Next slide, please. So uh, now the question is like, when we hear the term uh, safe water, what comes in our mind? Definitely uh, good quality water, free of pathogen and chemical contamination. In addition, uh, the water should also be available, accessible, um, affordable and acceptable. So safe water is dependent on ability to treat water while Rapid water quality monitoring at the point of use help us to choose the right kind of uh, treatment for different water sources. However, in, uh, in low income countries, monitoring water quality at the point of use can be a challenge. So next slide, please. So how, how do we do cutting edge research in low income countries? So for this, uh, we need to make our analytical tools and method portable so we could use them anywhere in the world. A few years ago, uh, Oxford Nanoport Technology released uh, a Minion, which is a memory stick size device for next generation sequencing. And now uh, we use Minion as one of the tools to conduct water quality monitoring in low income and middle, middle income countries. We, we recently combined a smaller and less expensive version of, uh, of same types of uh, specialist equipment uh, commonly found in state-of-the-art microbiology laboratories and came up with an idea of, of lab in suitcase. And Minion is an integral part of the suitcase lab, uh, which enables screening, screening of uh, millions of bacteria in a single water sample instead of running many tests in parallel to look for, for different pathogens. The genetic analysis that Minion does can bring, uh, uh, bring to light numerous hazard potentially present in the water. But such analysis is currently carried out in laboratory using uh, large and expensive machines. Uh, so, and, and then these facilities uh, are often not available in developing countries. And the process of sending sample from, from the affected countries to the UK or other countries which have uh, the, the lab facilities for detailed analysis can take more than a month. So the portable lab means Scientists can go directly to the location where waterborne disease is thought to be present and screen a water sample for genetic material 
uh, with results available within a day or two. So the, the, the data obtained from such uh, uh, portable uh, method or portable tools can be used for, for different uh, purposes. For instance, it can be used for measuring the effectiveness of uh, wastewater treatment uh, plants, for uh, uh, fecal source tracking, for identification of uh, waterborne hazard in surface or groundwater. So the rapid data generated uh, uh, will therefore give public health official more opportunity to quickly identify and, and deal with the local hazard, potentially saving uh, countless life. Next slide, please. So we, we demonstrated the technical feasibility of using this toolbox or like, like a suitcase lab for metal genomic analysis in, in two, case, two case study uh, application. One was uh, uh, to monitor uh, uh, the small wastewater treatment plant, which is located in uh, the remote location in, in UK. Another was uh, for water quality solving in, in low income country with only limited sanitation coverage and laboratory resources, which was in uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia uh, last year. Uh, so this work, uh, uh, the studied or like the pilot study we did uh, has been already published in Water Research. And if you are interested to know in more detail about this portable lab, including different tools and equipments we use. And if you want to understand how to use these tools, please uh, check our research article. It is uh, freely available. And today in this presentation, I will briefly provide the overview of the work we did in, in, in Addis Ethiopia and some of the key findings. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, so we took our, uh, uh, our, our portable lab, uh, put everything in a suitcase and we went to Ethiopia. So our task was to use this suitcase lab to, to survey the microbial water quality of Akaki River. The Akaki River is uh, the river in central Ethiopia and flows through Addis Ababa, which is the capital city of Ethiopia. Uh, so we monitored uh, four different sites in the, in the Akaki River and each site uh, has different land use pattern. For example, S1, uh, you, you can see in the map, uh, which is uh, the most upstream part. Uh, uh, so the people use this water uh, in, in, from, from site one for different kinds of activities such as bathing, uh, for, for taking bath, washing clothes, and also for irrigation. Uh, the other site, S3, uh, which uh, is uh, the site in, in Kebena River, uh, that flows to the center of the Addis Ababa city and receives uh, industrial discharge and mostly polluted uh, a tributary of uh, this Akaki River. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, so these are the pictures we took uh, at the point uh, uh, when we did the sampling. Uh, uh, as you can see, uh, as you can see uh, uh, in the second, second, second picture, you can see the foams floating uh, there, and this must be due to chemical contamination from from industrial discharge because this this river flows uh, uh, through the central part of the city. Next slide, please. So this is the overall uh, workflow uh, for the water quality testing uh, and the time taken to accomplish uh, each, each task. So uh, if you can see in the bottom, uh, so, uh, so these are the different tasks we normally do, we need to do. Uh, so basically the most important task will be the sampling. Uh, and then uh, we need to filter the water to, to trap uh, the bacterial biomass present in the water sample and then we perform DNA extraction, and then we do uh, PCR uh, as, a, as a part of library preparation, and then we pull all the samples together, we do sequencing, we generate data, and we process the data, and then finally interpret the data. Uh, in our uh, uh, portable lab, uh, in addition to metagenomic sequencing, we also do some basic uh, uh, physiochemical analysis of, of water samples. And we also do basic microbiology. For instance, we can also quantify uh, uh, the fecal coliform abundance in, in any kind of water sample. So uh, uh, in, in, in UK, the same task we could able to do within 24 hours, but in Ethiopia, it took us three days uh, from the point we collected the sample to the point we got the data. Uh, and data processing is a critical step and, and can be a bottleneck. In UK, uh, we could process the same amount of data in one hour, but it took us 
uh, approximately like six hours in Ethiopia. The reason behind this is the internet is speed. In Ethiopia, uh, the internet is speed, speed is obviously uh, not as fast as compared to UK, but we use the fastest available internet uh, uh, in Ethiopia. And it still it took us six hours to process the data. Uh, so, uh, so within three days, we were able to get the, uh, the full picture. And it also depends on, uh, on, on, on like uh, the sampling sites because in Ethiopia, we had to spend whole one day for sampling, but in UK, uh, the sampling sites were very close to each other. So we could finish within, within an hour. So, so, so uh, from the point you collect the sample uh, to the point you get the, the data, it might take, I would say up to two days, depending on internet speed. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, some of the key findings uh, from, from, uh, from for, for Akaki River, the total and fecal coliform uh, uh, bacteria plate count results uh, indicates that uh, wastewater is a source of uh, river water pollution, especially inside three, four, and five. Uh, uh, to more comprehensive microbial water quality surveying by, by, by performing 16S amplicon uh, sequencing with portable uh, 16, uh, sequencing device further confirm the presence of fecal indicator bacteria like bacteroides, ribotella, and other bacteria from family Enterobacteriaceae, in, in particularly high abundance in water from location three, four, and five. Overall, uh, uh, these results suggest that water quality of Akaki River is a concern uh, as Akaki River uh, water is being used for agricultural irrigation in downstream uh, of site five. Next slide, please. Uh, we, we know that uh, NGS is a powerful screening tool, uh, which in this particular case led to discovery of Arcobacter uh, butleri, uh, which is a significant waterborne pathogen in this watershed. Uh, this observation from the Minion for Arcobacter uh, were further confirmed by, by qPCR analysis, as you can see high abundance of uh, this particular genes from Arcobacter butleris when we quantified with QPCR. And Arcobacter is uh, associated with watery diarrhea. And this pathogen is, is mostly found in, in great varieties of, of meats, including chicken, beef, pork, lamb, which is high prevalence in poultry. And in Ethiopia, people, they normally use raw meat as a part of their dish. So it was obvious to see high abundance of this uh, bacteria Arco Arcobacter in very high abundance. If we would not have used NGS for, uh, for, uh, for this kind of monitoring, we would never discover this bacteria in this watershed. Next slide, please. So uh, the take home message, uh, the lab in suitcase, uh, it could hold the key to safe water and sanitation. The metagenomic data allows simultaneous screening of various putative pathogen and fecal indicator uh, bacteria. This can subsequently guide the choice of complementary methods such as qPCR or culturing to more solidly, solidly establish the microbes associated with health hazard. Uh, for instance, we could uh, develop a separate qPCR method for Arcobacter once we knew that Arcobacter was quite highly abundant in this watershed. And we can also use Arcobacter uh, as an like emerging bacteria uh, and can be used uh, for fecal pollution source tracking, and then portable uh, methods comprising uh, uh, sequencing, metagenomic sequencing has potential to facilitate water safety monitoring plans in both low income and middle income countries. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, as is well. And uh, you had uh, given very nice, of course, I, you didn't help me to make this mobile uh, lab in the suitcase. Uh, how much it cost? Of course, I will tell you, uh, I, we will talk about uh, uh, that later. But just cost, you can tell me. So the initial investment uh, uh, can take up to uh, 8,000 8, uh, um, pound. Like okay. 8,000 um, pound. Yeah. So this is uh, okay. We, I will talk to that uh, when we will be in the uh, discussion. 
So our next speaker is a kind of uh, my referee too. Uh, that is uh, because many times uh, when and choosing a referee is not a difficult thing. <laughs> it's a very difficult thing because uh, you have to trust that man completely. And I, I trust uh, that uh, the professor has no completely because I have seen how meticulous he has been on his analysis, how meticulous he has been on geochemistry part also, because he doesn't work on uh, like what uranium geochemistry. And uh, now we are, uh, we are, we have submitted some paper on arsenic, uh, which is under review in uh, hazardous material, uh, because he has not given too much thing written in his bio sketch. So I have to use these experiences. Uh, he was uh, almost a mentor. Uh, I mean, the, he, we co-authored uh, a few papers so far. And, uh, but the percolate one, um, of course, uh, the word I heard from him, uh, of course, we published on USA, um, the, uh, but Diwali one also was uh, his help um, because of which I could uh, write it a kind of single author paper, but uh, because I, uh, so, and uh, he is the director of UNL Water Science uh, Laboratory. He has been mentor for several Wadi scholars, including Sanjeev and me. Um, and uh, there is, uh, uh, he, any, uh, his lab can offer you several cutting edge uh, research. If you can find a, a new contaminant, whether emerging or legacy or whatever, but uh, he, can, uh, he can get you, get, get it analyzed. Uh, he lives with his uh, instrument and his analytical protocols and uh, with his uh, whistle going on. Uh, when his whistle is on, you think you can know that he's at his best. So uh, with this uh, short introduction, Professor uh, Dan, uh, it's my honor to invite you uh, for your talk. Well, well thank you, Manish. And uh, I apologize if I was late to joining the, uh, the conference. Uh, it is a little bit early here this morning, so <clears throat> I uh, I hope I can speak coherently. I didn't prepare any any uh, PowerPoint or slides. I, I really thought it would be better to uh, kind of provide some observations uh, that that I've uh, sort of uh, acquired over the past thirty years uh, in testing the water. Uh, I, I, as Manish has, has mentioned, I've worked in a lot of different uh, research projects where we have to test uh, specific contaminants. Uh, and uh, most of that has been in an agricultural context. Uh, uh, I live in Nebraska, which is a very uh, heavily intensive agricultural state. So we use a lot of fertilizers and pesticides. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, surface and groundwater resources. And I think that's one reason that uh, the university and the state has supported a, a pretty uh, high-tech facility for testing uh, water uh, and environmental samples. Uh, some of the observations that, that I've made uh, is that uh, we, we have more people on the planet. Uh, more people uh, equates to a greater demand for food production uh, and an increase in pollution. <clears throat> and I guess that's, that's, those are two trends that will not disappear in the, in the next few decades. Uh, we really have not figured out how to develop uh, our societies and uh, build our cities and grow food without also polluting uh, the environment. Uh, that pollution uh, ends up interfering with uh, in, uh, beneficial uses of water resources. Uh, in Nebraska, we have uh, large areas of the state that are, are contaminated with high levels of nitrate uh, most of that nitrate uh, originated from uh, fertilizing uh, irrigated crops. Along with nitrate, we have uh, pesticides and pesticide degradation products. Uh, atrazine uh, continues to be one of the most heavily used uh, pesticides uh, in spite of the fact that we have uh, Roundup Ready crops available to producers. So we actually are having more pesticide use uh, in agriculture than ever before. So uh, in that context, what could the, the role of rapid testing bring to uh, maintaining a safe environment for people to live and work in? <clears throat> I think uh, we need sc rapid screening assays. Uh, uh, and I'm sure that uh, many of the presenters at this conference have uh, discussed the details of those assays. 
<clears throat> my experience with the rapid testing is that they're not quite as good as laboratory methods. So we always go back to uh, comparing the results from the rapid screening assays to uh, traditional um, laboratory methods. Um, when I uh, teach uh, environmental laboratory testing, I <clears throat> mentioned to the students that uh, every time we uh, conduct uh, a laboratory test, it really is an experiment. You know, so th that experiment has been conducted previously, uh, and, and it has to be validated time and time again to, to demonstrate that the method still works as we expect it to. Uh, in environmental samples, we often have unpredictable matrices that we're dealing with. So th there are co-contaminants that may interfere uh, with those uh, tests in the laboratory and in the rapid screening assays. So it really, it, it, it falls to the user of, of those uh, rapid screening assays to demonstrate that the method works uh, as we intend it to. <clears throat> I, I am a person that does measurements. I, I have made a living uh, making measurements. <clears throat> and uh, as Manish mentioned, I uh, take pride in making high quality measurements. So we are continuously uh, proving uh, when we make the measurements that they are as accurate and precise as possible uh, with that given method. Uh, it really, you can't take anything for granted uh, when, you're, when you're making a test in the laboratory. And, and I would also ask that uh, people can take that into consideration when you're doing uh, rapid testing methods uh, in the field or, or in the laboratory. Uh, we, we need these rapid testing assays because we have more things that we need to measure uh, to prove that the water is safe, uh, either for human consumption or for use uh, in irrigation or for recreation. Uh, so we really need both. We need our screening assays and we need laboratory tests to, to, to show that that water uh, will be safe uh, for all intended uses. So um, what else did I want to say? Um, I guess I'll, I'll speak just a little bit more about specific contaminants that we've uh, uh, developed methods for. Uh, and Manish mentioned the arsenic and the uranium contamination. Uh, the, uh, those contaminants are actually natural, naturally occurring in the environment. And we believe uh, that those are being uh, produced in water resources because of agricultural activities. Uh, either from uh, uh, irrigation or fertilizer application or a combination of those things. So it's likely we're going to see a release of these uh, uh, naturally occurring contaminants, such as arsenic and uranium, uh, and those are going to wind up in our food products, right? There really is no mechanism for removing those once they're released into the water, at least not a natural mechanism. Uh, some of the other types of contaminants that I've noticed uh, are occurring uh, in recent years are cyanotoxins, uh, especially in agricultural areas like uh, Nebraska. We see uh, our surface water reservoirs uh, every summer uh, have uh, toxic algal, algal blooms. Those, are, those can be measured using uh, ELISA assays. But the, uh, the ELISA test uh, really only gives us a, a, an approximation of the total concentration of the toxin, and it, it's only specific to a certain type of toxin. And really, uh, cyanotoxins, there are probably hundreds of different variations of those with differing toxicities. So we have to do both. We do a screening assay, and then we uh, take samples back to the laboratory and maybe would use uh, LC mass spectrometry to characterize individual uh, toxins that are present in that sample. Um, I don't see those cyanotoxins uh, going away anytime soon. Those are things that, that have occurred uh, from the beginning of the, of the origins of our planet. Uh, and it's only because of uh, the conditions that we're producing in surface waters uh, that they're occurring at, at, at more uh, a higher frequency. And then lastly, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the the wastewater that we produce has an increasing uh, variety of uh, biologically active contaminants that we refer to uh, as emerging contaminants, uh, pharmaceuticals and personal care products, uh, illicit drugs. Those are all chemicals that we use in, in everyday life. 
and uh, they, they go into the environment after we've used them. Uh, and we don't really have any good science to indicate what the effects of those contaminants are once they're introduced into the environment. Uh, and that's uh, an area of research that I've been pretty active in in the last uh, 15 or 20 years is to look at uh, the effects of these uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, specifically antibiotics, uh, which we all depend upon to treat uh, infections. Uh, if we continue to use antibiotics and pharmaceuticals uh, at increasing levels and those are released into the environment, they're bound to have some effects on uh, pathogens, uh, specifically pathogens that uh, uh, can cause human infections. So um, I, I think those are all the topics that I intended to talk about, uh, and I'll be interested in uh, hearing the rest of the presentations and, uh, and participating in the discussion this morning. Thank you, thank you, Dan. Uh, actually, the, um, that's why we gave this uh, chance to use or don't use, because many times uh, when you don't use uh, PowerPoint, you are more talking to your experience. So it was very enlightening. Uh, I have noted some questions and we'll ask you after the end presentation. Okay. So um, the next uh, presentation uh, is going to be my, I would say, the best Chinese friend. Uh, the, <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, he is uh, Mr. Jian Zhang. He came in India twice under this project because we could not find uh, some other people <laughs> coming to India. And uh, during this travel, and I went twice uh, to his university uh, at Newcastle. Um, he is by nature is very, very uh, great person to be with. He is entrepreneur from the mind. He already uh, made some company and sold it. And then uh, the, now he is working on in area of environmental engineering, sustainable building back, backgrounds, focusing on solid waste management, wastewater treatment and air quality improvement. Basically he is, uh, he is going to whatever uh, uh, he, a, he ha his PhD, a part of that is uh, leak detection. And uh, he has done a very sustainable uh, study of in IIT Gandhinagar campus. And now probably today he is going to tell something about Newcastle too. So uh, Jian, uh, thank you for joining and please uh, you have your 10 minutes. Yes, thank you very much Manish. I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, well, Yeah, right. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Manish. Uh, well, you, as you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm Jian Zhang, a student from uh, Newcastle University. I'm a former uh, student from uh, David Werner and uh, a half student from Manish Kumasar here. And uh, all the people that I know here, uh, no matter David Werner or Manish Kumar, or even Kishir, they are all working on uh, providing uh, sufficient or safe water uh, uh, to the people. Um, but so it is unacceptable, uh, unacceptable for me to see people are wasting the, their efforts in the end point, which is the, uh, in the building and no matter in the student dormitory here, in, my, in this case, in Newcastle uh, campus. So my topic today, I'm going to show you the real case that happened in Newcastle University and uh, how much low efficiency uh, they are using the endpoint end water uh, in the building in student dormitories. So in the first the slices here, I'm going to show that this is the student dormitory real case that happened in the Newcastle universities, uh, Winterson Terrace. There were three buildings there where they are similar uh, student dormitories and two, two of them are uh, uh, shared flat and one of them are uh, en suite. And so uh, I would like to show, show people the total water uh, usage, which is a gray cylinder here. It's around, uh, it's around 150 uh, in the early two years. We did nothing in the early two years, but we identified the, the wastage and the leakage from this gray a cylinder which is in red cylinders here. This is that is means that the the left ninety uh, left ninety around uh, liters per person per day uh, blue cylinder 
water usage is a real water demand, then we proved that it is right. It doesn't change no matter what did, uh, uh, what interventions, what have uh, after years by year. So we have successfully reduced the uh, 50 percentages of the wastage and the leakage uh, by our efforts. Um, and here we would like to see the major, the major reason, which is a key reason that's causing the leakage the, and the, the wastage is, is, uh, is due to malfunction of the water appliances. But the key, uh, but the key problems here is the toilet. So uh, to example here, so that uh, this toilet has been uh, working for more than 10 years in, in Winston Terrace. And the serve time is more than 10 years, and we can identify uh, the leakage running, uh, the, the leakage when it's a, a continuous running toilet. Uh, like for example, here the toilet A here in the red, in the red place, and we can see if this if they we if this 500 liters per hour leaking uh, last for uh, 100 day 100 days. Well, you know this is a real case that we identified the, in Newcastle. Uh, it's a quick calculation. It's 500 liters per hour lasting for 100 days. It should be 1.2 uh, million liters uh, water wasted and uh, around uh, uh, 1,200 uh, cubic meters wasted. Uh, so it's uh, around 200, uh, 2,000 pounds. It's a big money. And we have successfully, well, after four years, we have successfully saved uh, uh, more than um, 20,000 pounds in total for this, for only these three uh, uh, student dormitories. So our campus, well, sustainable managers are very happy about our results. And uh, and uh, and next and next here, I want to show people. Uh, the error rate for those toilets. People might ask, this is might be a special case, might doesn't happen in your place or, or your campus. But I would like to I would like to share here. So we, we find the air toilet rate is around to 20 points, uh, 20.5 to 30.5 once a year, which is means three of the 10 toilets might be malfunctioned uh, in one in a year. Uh, but what we did, uh, how we, how how did we to reduce the uh, the leakage? Uh, we tried to shorten the leakage duration time for each block. So you can see from the uh, right hand, uh, this graph shows we did some strategies, interventions, and awareness improvement videos to help people to reduce the duration time of the leakage. In the first, uh, in the first. Uh, Year, which is 16 to 17, uh, 2016 to 17. And uh, so it was uh, around 100, 200 days a year where the leaking, where it's a big leaking, like a, like a, what I estimate is 4,000 4, pounds if we do nothing to this. Um, and, but uh, uh, we, after our effort, we have reduced it uh, from 200 to about 100. Uh, for Windows and Terrace One and uh, another two buildings, we have successfully uh, to make sure them uh, touch zero uh, in, uh, in in the most recent days. Uh, so, uh, so in conclusion, I will say people, uh, I, I will tell people uh, that uh, there is no efficiency uh, a real case that happened in. Uh, uh, no matter Newcastle, that and also I identified some problems, similar similar problems in uh, anti and uh, it's caused by a wastage and leakage is counts uh, around uh, 36.2 of the total water consumption well, in Winters Terrace. Um, the key reason is malfunction of water appliances, but the major cause is a con continuous running toilet is uh, uh, generally uh, running over 175 liters per hour. Uh, well, its error rate is about uh, 30 percentages. And the, each, each hour, the wastage is equal to at least the two people whole day water demand. It's a big, it's a big water, it's a big wastage. Well, 
And so the endpoint uh, is more valuable than raw water source because uh, because uh, due to what we uh, identified uh, we those waters, those treated water are using more treating energies, chemicals, and even pumping energies. Uh, so the so the endpoint water usage efficiency needs our more, more attention. So uh, to leave some take home messages here, uh, I would like to suggest to please report or fix your malfunctional water appliances on time. It can uh, can uh, help us save more water. And uh, make sure the most uh, use of water, uh, mo make sure most of use of water at home, no matter use your washing, uh, ha hand water in toilet flushing or what you did, there are a lot of things online, but what you have to increase awareness of yourself or the others um, and help us saving the efforts, no matter from all the people here or all the people are providing uh, the water. And uh, the third one I, say, say, I should say is uh, uh, monitoring the usage for solving the hidden leakage or waste problem is very important. That's what I did uh, for, uh, my, uh, for my PhD where monitoring is suggested. And also uh, if anyone interested in the animation, how, how do we uh, in, increase the awareness for people or for the audience, uh, you can scan this uh, QR here and you can know what we uh, what we did our compass did in improving the awareness uh, yeah that's sorts of things today and uh, thank you very much Manish again um, thanks for this thank conference. you Gian. Uh, yeah so you have kept the time that is a good training to have and uh, congratulations I heard you got the uh, you have been offered a position of faculty so just finished your PhD and join. Uh, can you just uh, now uh, the, remove your presentation so that all the panelists become uh, online and video on? And now the, let's take the questions off. Uh, the, so Dan, are you there? Yeah. Uh, Kisor, can you just uh, lower down your video camera? Uh, yes. Okay. Oh, this video camera is set for David, and that's why <laughs> the, it is uh, like that. Okay, um, so I will take uh, first uh, two questions uh, from the audience and then I will come to the there. Uh, Dr. Sudhir Kumar, probably from NIH, uh, he is uh, heading a division uh, there. So he is asking that if there is any solution of pergence of uranium and arsenic contamination in groundwater, more than permissible limit as it is found in several places in India. So is there any solution? Um, I guess that direct question would be directed to me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a solution? I, I think uh, we have to understand what, what the cause is. Uh, and I think uh, and it, until we understand the processes that contribute to mobilization and contamination in groundwater, we're not going to be able to devise a solution. Um, I, I do think that it has a lot to do with the use of fertilizer. Uh, and overuse or over application of uh, irrigation water, at least in agricultural areas. Uh, this seems to be intensifying chemical weathering. So in my mind, the, the most practical solution would be to reduce the amount of fertilizer and irrigation water uh, that's resulting in, uh, that causes the release of arsenic and uranium uh, and other geogenic contaminants. Okay. Um... So in a uh, nutshell, if they will say, uh, so do, of course, so if I will say there is a solution or there is not a solution? Well, uh, prevention is the, is the best solution. Uh, then if you're not able to prevent it from occurring, you're gonna have to treat the water uh, as it's being used. So uh, treat, treatment yeah. is very expensive uh, mm -hmm. and virtually impossible uh, if you're irrigating crops. So uh, I yeah, still yeah, think yeah. prevention is probably our best solution. Mm. Uh, because this question is uh, really uh, one of my um, favorite. So um, prevention is like uh, getting, uh, we, we can stop water getting enriched more, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it means that uh, stopping the triggering, uh, triggering uh, causes that is right, uh, letting right. it mobilize into the system. Yeah. Yep. 
Uh, now coming to the Kisor, uh, and then I, I will start my uh, questions. Uh, the, what is the cost of a lab in a suitcase? And, uh, and uh, is there a way to collect data without using the internet? Uh, so in order to set up the lab, uh, uh, excluding the consumable price, just to set up a lab, uh, like means like buying all the equipments you, we will need. It costs around 8,000 uh, pounds. And then consumables you need to always buy every time you are planning to do some kind of survey. So setting up lab is 8,000 uh, pounds. And then coming back to the internet question. Actually, uh, um, internet is only needed in, in, in one particular uh, data processing task. And at the moment, without internet, we won't be able to do that. So I would say, yeah, for that particular step, I mean, in order to do sequencing, you don't need internet. Yeah, so you can, actually you internet, can... internet is a kind of uh, how it is being delivered rather than uh, how, I mean, the how to use their data and be available. But uh, of course the data is uh, for data, uh, I mean, we can spread the results using internet. Yeah, the sequencing data, actually, once you collect the data from sequencing device, uh, you always need to, to compare or map against the database. So, uh, and database are mostly like available online. Uh, or if, if you can write your own, own script, uh, uh, like bioinformatics script, and if you can download that database that you want to compare against, you, you might not need even internet. But that will be a little bit complicated uh, because the idea of, uh, of using uh, this MinION platform was to make it more user friendly. And if you have to use like complicated script for data processing, then I mean, it won't be easier to use in developing countries where researchers lack that kind of uh, computational skills. So actually, uh, now coming to the this, uh, what I want to take from you guys is that uh, the there are uh, two three parts of uh, the schemes. One, I would uh, ask um, then to tell me is that because there are many young uh, researcher here who is listening to you, and uh, so if uh, there is a different parts of the. Uh, analysis system. One is that how to understand a new uh, instrument, how to understand a new contaminant before you analyze. Let's suppose that you never analyzed a contaminant and uh, you are asked to analyze. How you approach that, okay, for which, this contaminant, which method and how you approach. Can you just let us get into your head <laughs> about that? Sure. So, um... So that, that's actually the, one of the favorite, most favorite parts of my job. Uh, and uh, I enjoy uh, digging into the literature, the scientific literature uh, on a new contaminant. Uh, and if you do that, you'll find that there are literally hundreds of different ways to measure things. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is part of the joy of discovery. You have to decide uh, after reviewing the literature what the best approach is to measuring a, a particular type of contaminant uh, and then you look at your laboratory and, and see what equipment you have. So it really, it's less prescriptive uh, in my uh, opinion than the way analytical chemistry is taught. Uh, if, if you actually look at what other people have done uh, previously uh, to measure the contaminant, um, you learn the literature and, and then uh, you, as long as you understand how the instrument operates, uh, the theory behind it uh, and what uh, precautions uh, or what steps are needed in order to prepare this, the sample. Um, it really is, it, it becomes a, a, a whole new scientific experiment that you get to conduct uh, in your laboratory. So this is, I mean, uh, the one thing that was interesting in your reply that you look at the contaminants, you read about it, but you look at the instrument available too. I yeah. mean, that, that, that is uh, one of the aspects I want uh, new uh, minds to understand because uh, I have seen the, some, uh, that uh, it's not like if pharmaceutical PPCPs, you need to have LCM, SMS. Yeah, uh, sometimes right. you can even do it with UV spectrophotometer. Um, yeah. And uh, um, of course, one of the, like uh, 
uh, of course, Alok has not done it uh, so far, but of course, uh, you can always look at uh, your laboratory, what is available. And this is a new uh, approach that everybody needs to do. However, so coming to the second, uh, the problem of the environmental engineering, and maybe Kisor, Jian, uh, all of you can relate with this, that a civil engineer hate chemistry. ASA, a, uh, the many physics, I think only chemistry guys love chemistry and even sometimes they <laughs> also hate chemistry. But uh, the point is, when they come to a, a instrument uh, or they come to the analytical world or monitoring world, um, what will be your uh, suggestion to those people who uh, start learning, a kind of learning and trying to think that, uh, oh, this is not I am good at. So how mm -hmm. a beginner can become very good at uh, analyzing? Uh, the, the way I learned analytical chemistry was by taking the equipment apart and putting it back together. So, so you need to be very comfortable with uh, the technology uh, along with the science. Uh, I, I've seen that, that, that uh, often chemistry uh, kind of turns people off from the science, uh, but actually the analytical side really got me excited about uh, learning chemistry. As soon as I saw how the technology could be used to answer questions, um, it really sparked the enthusiasm for me to, to learn as much as I could about chemistry. So for me personally, it was the technology that, that really drove my interest in, in digging deep into the literature and, and learning about how we can use uh, the principles of chemistry to make measurements uh, uh, to understand what's going on in the environment. So Kisor, can you uh, recall anything such difficulty uh, when me, you were developing or learning new techniques? For me, for me, like uh, using an instrument or developing a method is, is, a, is, is not a challenging thing. It's, it can be very simple. But understanding the data is can be very challenging. <laughs> interpretation. Yeah, interpretation can be very challenging. Even like when I was, uh, I, I did my PhD in completely different topic to what I'm doing now. I had no background in, 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 uh, in NGS. I had no background in interpreting this NGS data. Uh, but I had kind of understanding, like listening from people's seminar. I knew that how this data can be used. And, and I tried to, even in my interview, I tried to, I did sequencing with the help of, like by outsourcing my sample. And I, I took help from other people to interpret my data. But I knew like what, I knew what I was looking in my data, I could interpret. And then I use that understanding during my interview and I got the job. And, and then I had like whole two years to learn it. And then when I was, <laughs> when I got the job, I mean, I had to be enthusiastic and I learned it within like two, three months. So now I feel very comfortable. So you need to take it seriously and you need to have an interest. Wow. This so is, uh, I am sorry, I somehow I am deviating from the theme, but uh, the it is fine. They're listening this on this platform because that's what, uh, many of my uh, scholars or our institute scholars needs to know. Uh, Jian, uh, what about this leak detection experience and surveying things goes? How do you think is that rapid methods can uh, really uh, needful for environmental uh, sustenance? Well, uh, well, Manisha, you know, uh, I'm a student uh, not, well, basically originally from this background, you know, I'm a student from civil engineering building environment. So um, I would like to say, first of all, we need to find uh, our motivation, what we want from, well, like what, uh, what you said before the previous question, uh, uh, if you learn the chemistry and uh, you have to know what you want the chemistry do, the, what, what you want, what role you want he played in your civil engineering. Uh, like Carlin said, uh, he wants to use bacteria uh, in uh, concrete uh, or what I want, I want to provide a safe indoor uh, or indoor um, hygiene or safe uh, environment uh, to people, no matter in the air or the water. Well, I will do, I will do, I will do the, um, I will do the air safety job uh, late, uh, later in my poster doctor. I already got the offer and, and I think you have already uh, know that. Yeah. 
So I would like to say motivation is very important, and uh, and then the risk assessment is the things that. Uh, so actually, I I would uh, just this is the last part of the, my uh, the discussion is that uh, like uh, Dan has told that uh, the rapid testing uh, is essential, and of course we all are understanding that actually the online monitoring is happening because the next thing that we are uh, talking about river health, what we have seen is that uh, uh, that the especially for river case, if some spill happens, it will be not staying to be noted until uh, tomorrow morning. And, uh, but, uh, the but it will cause the destruction of uh, the several uh, places. My percolate, uh, um, the monitoring of Ahmedabad uh, shows that even before uh, Diwali, uh, the Sarmati River percolate goes so high. And if, you would, if I would have not sampling it, uh, I would have not knowing it uh, ever. Uh, I I thought that Diwali will happen and then water will show the, some peak of perchlorate. But I had to take a background sample and I took and I found that that sample was the highest uh, in perchlorate concentration. So, um, uh, but you are saying that the lab uh, correlation is also important, that rapid uh, uh, the testing, it has to be the corroborated with the lab testing. So how do you do with the variation for part number one? And part number two is that how about the guidelines? If there is a like 10 PPB becomes 5 PPB or 5 PPB becomes 1 PPB. So how uh, the, I mean, the serious is the guidelines uh, and uh, how do you see the role of the guidelines uh, in environmental uh, improvements? So you're talking about uh, allowable contaminant levels? Yeah. What, yeah. What, what, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So that, that's an interesting question and that's actually could be a whole conference uh, unto itself. <laughs> uh, th those uh, contaminant levels are approximations uh, and they're based on uh, uh, laboratory experiments and epidemiological studies. It really is a lot of guesswork. So uh, the establishment of these contaminant levels is, is really a whole science unto itself. Uh, and it really is an approximation. And when you understand that, when you understand that these contaminant levels that we uh, we follow and try to enforce uh, in um, uh, maintaining uh, safe drinking water, for example, are really just approximations. It makes it, in my mind, it makes it even more urgent <clears throat> to understand what is causing uh, the occurrence of these contaminants, such as uranium and arsenic, and, and try to prevent it. Uh, because if we're uh, using an approximation to measure risk, uh, uh, to say uh, uh, drinking contaminated water, then it's really more important uh, that we understand what's causing this problem and try to do something to prevent it from happening. Um, so Kisor, do you have anything to add to this question? Because this is the last question I am taking up. Uh, actually, uh, what I would say is, uh, because some of the like, I mean, uh, the, you can more focus on that uh, yeah, the results I, obtained in the rapid and uh, uh, yeah. laboratory. So I mean, there are some 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 uh, some pathogens uh, like for for instance, uh, they can be present in very very uh, uh, very low abundance. Uh, so sometimes uh, like you need to generate more data to detect that particular particular pathogen. So you need to understand that. You need to understand like what might be their abundance in your sample. So if you have that kind of understanding, then you can always go for 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 for, for more data. So so one like in in if you if you detect hundred thousand bacteria and if the abundance of that bacteria in that hundred thousand is one one in one in hundred thousand, then if you want to be more sure, then you need to make sure that you generate more data so that you can frequently detect that particular pathogen. So, um, okay, so with this, Jian, uh, I mean, uh, thank you very much. And uh, very so much. I, I would say that before we uh, go to the next session, it is very good time to, if everybody can switch on their uh, video, I can take a picture, uh, a screenshot. I can take a screenshot so that, uh, of course, for, uh, so that you can enjoy that on Facebook. Uh, because that is uh, the, also the proof that I have invited you and you came. Uh, so, the Professor Chandan Mahanta, are you there? Can you ask us to switch off the video? Yeah.
No, no, switch on the video. <laughs> Alok, you may also. Sanjeev, you may also. Um, yeah, actually, now Sanjeev has gone. So one, two, and three. See? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, OK. So uh, with this, uh, nobody needs to go anywhere. You are, uh, I mean, the, you can be here and hear the next, uh, listen to the next uh, uh, theme, uh, which is going to be on uh, liver health and geomorphology. Um, but uh, I am really thankful that you all, and uh, uh, especially Dan, who is uh, too early in the morning there, and even uh, he is annoying his cat also because uh, it was around him. Uh, so thank you, Dan. Uh, the, you have been instrumental, and Kisor and Jian, who has visited under this project and given full support. Without you two guys, I think we could have not made the four pillar, only two pillar. Uh, so thank you very much.